thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor O'Connor. Uh, I just wish my kids had been here to, uh, to hear that. Uh, and congratulations uh, to, to you on uh, over a dozen years of outstanding leadership here at Griffith. Um, Griffith, you, you all think of everything. I mean, you even had the umbrellas ready for, uh, for tonight. And I think this summit is just one more example of um, uh, Griffith um, bringing the world here to Brisbane. So it's an honor uh, for me to be here. It's an honor as well to address the Integrity 20. Uh, in fact, you know, having flown in here yesterday from Washington, D.C., I could use a dose of integrity <laughs> or 20. Um, so I appreciate that it's, that it's fairly rare these days uh, for anyone running for office to be invited to speak uh, about integrity. So I take this as either a very special and rare honor or a clerical error. Um, <laughs> my wife actually has her money on clerical error. Um, my, my wife, Becky, and, and our kids are actually going to be here uh, to join us today, even for such a short trip. But you know, um, we're in a campaign, and they're doing what um, uh, families of candidates do these days. Uh, they're, they're meeting with Russian intelligence operatives. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, anyway, thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful to be given this break from D.C. and from the campaign trail, but uh, even more, I'm grateful for the chance to reflect on what may be the greatest challenge that free nations face today, how to restore integrity, and public trust to Western democracies at a critical moment in our history. So despite the length of my address, my, my point's gonna be a simple one. That the shock waves that we are feeling in democracies all around the world are the result of two colliding forces that have shaken our moral fiber. The first is a public failure to keep up with runaway technology. And by that, I mean technology is accelerating faster than the rules and the norms that govern us. Technological changes occur with a breathtaking speed and scale and reach, and this disrupts everything, including how we relate to each other. Our traditional values can get clouded and they can get degraded. We, presume, uh, we pursue fame for fame's sake. Uh, we pursue brand over quality. We mistake debt for wealth, and we accept lies and spin as facts. And this has weakened the very seams of our moral fabric, and it threatens the trust that binds us all together. The, the second related force is the exploitation, the deliberate exploitation of that technology. Hostile nations and networks have recognized the vulnerable state of our institutions, and they are using technology to exploit it. Fake news sites can bombard Western nations with lies faster than current technologies can establish the truth. And I really make no mistake about this. There is a deliberate and concerted campaign going on today to weaponize information. Its goal is to tear apart the liberal domestic uh, global order, using our own technologies. This is a very serious threat, and it's why a summit on integrity and how to restore it could not be more timely. So since integrity is what's at stake, let's start with it. What is it? Because integrity is something that we tend to notice most acutely when it's not around. It's like society's operating system. Everything else depends on it. You give your word, you keep your word. Um, you, you treat others as you wish they treat you. And when I drove here tonight, yeah, I trusted that other drivers wouldn't cross that yellow line and uh, kill me. When I took the podium tonight, I trusted that I'd be the only one up here. We wouldn't have all 600 of us standing up giving a speech simultaneously. Um, integrity doesn't require some profound act. You don't have to be famous to have integrity or have a special title or wealth. Most people with integrity don't have any of those things. Parents, coaches. Um, teachers. They demonstrate integrity simply by honoring a social code, even if it means making a sacrifice for the greater good. My first president, President John F. Kennedy, wrote a book called Profiles in Courage, uh, which was not about him. It was a description of his heroes, people who had performed courageous acts of service. 
And he wrote, quote, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. Um, my current president is less enamored with that vision <laughs> and a bit less poetic. Responding to criticism that he did not believe in sacrificing in the service of others in 2013, he tweeted, quote, sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest, and you all know it. Please don't feel so stupid and insecure. It's not your fault. <laughs> now, there's a serious point here. In half of a human lifetime, we've gone from electing John F. Kennedy to electing Donald J. Trump. We've gone from Neil Armstrong to Lance Armstrong. We need to understand what is causing this. Because it's not that the truth has changed, or that human DNA has changed, or that our operating system has changed. We are the same people living in the same world. Something else is going on. So let me go through four ways in which integrity has been breaking down, and the role I believe that our passive approach to new technology has, has played. Um, I'm gonna start with confusing fame with achievement. At the very least, integrity requires doing something that contributes to people other than yourself. We all claim that, that we have integrity until we have to make a choice uh, between our interest and the public interest. And that's when our character is revealed. People who produce something particularly interesting and valuable for others sometimes become well-known, sometimes even famous. But only a small fraction of people who contribute in that way become famous. Fame, fame doesn't even mean that you've achieved anything. I mean, Cato Kalin is famous. Uh, and fame was never the point of achieving. But fame has come to eclipse achievement as a goal, in part because of technology. Andy Warhol predicted that in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. New technologies then have made international fame possible for more people more quickly than ever before in human history. And it used to be easier to achieve something than to be famous. Now, it's actually easier to be famous. A succession of technologies measure fame and give it a platform. Going back to the 60s, the Nielsen ratings discovered how to show advertisers which shows were popular rather than good. Pollsters helped politicians recognize which ideas were popular rather than good. And at the same time, we created more means for people to be seen by large audiences. Cable TV had more airtime than things to air, so they came up with programs that don't require talent. Reality shows, which are cheap and easy to produce. And fairly soon, people were becoming famous for doing pretty much any normal human activity. Dating, gossiping, cooking, overeating, losing your temper. My favorite example is Big Brother, which seems to have long stretches of people sleeping. <laughs> We've made stars of the real housewives of every city on the planet, and with the advent of social media, we created a whole new dimension, the Kardashian family, where fame itself is the achievement. With social media, we now collect and measure fame precisely for its own sake. We measure people online by how many likes, friends, and shares they get. Kim Kardashian has 30 million friends on Facebook. Her achievement, her contribution to society, as far as anyone can tell, is that she has 30 million friends on Facebook. <laughs> and there's no distinction made between her and people who've produced something for others to enjoy. The logic is that she's famous, so she must be doing something valuable, or she wouldn't be famous. Now, it hasn't always been that way. In fact, to put this in perspective, just a couple decades ago, we used to mock fame for fame's sake. In the 1980s, 1990s, this wonderful country bestowed upon this world Robin Leach and his show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And anyone who understood Australia's tall poppy culture appreciated that the show was mocking the conspicuous consumption and shallowness of the people who were actually willing to appear on that show. Donald Trump appeared on it in 1994. <laughs> 
among other memorable things that he said in that episode, he stated that he was glad that his then one-year-old daughter, Tiffany, had inherited his beautiful wife, Marla's legs, and he hoped she'd also get other attributes of Marla. He was the perfect guest for that show. But that same man, operating the same way, is no longer a commercial developer showing off for Robin Leach, or even the star of his own reality TV show. He's now the president of the United States, and he understands that the rules have changed. Fame is now considered an achievement in itself. An unhealthy percentage of people do not draw a distinction between his fame and what he has actually done. For example, look, whether you like Mr. Trump or not, objectively speaking, accuracy is not his strong suit. <laughs> Yet 36% of all Americans today believe he is honest and trustworthy despite all the evidence to the contrary. Trump himself has said that if you're famous, people will let you get away with anything. He bragged about using his fame to grope women without waiting for their consent. Quote, when you're a star, they let you do it, Trump said. Quote, you can do anything, close quote. Indeed, he said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I won't lose voters. He's not the only one who has figured out that fame can be a faster and simpler way of getting what you want than actually doing something that requires sacrifice for others. Today, for a fee, people's profile can appear first on the Google search, creating a false fame. For a fee, businesses can boost their Yelp reviews. Advertisers can secretly enlist online influencers to make their products famous. You know who needs to wait for Neil Armstrong each generation when you can create a real housewife of somewhere every week. Unconsciously, we've come to measure success less and less by accomplishment or achievement for others, and more simply by the number of clicks. Now, I focused on fame, and I won't speak for as long as I have on the other subjects, but I was focused on fame for a reason. This is not simply about mistaking fame for achievement. It's something more insidious. It is putting yourself ahead of others. It is about doing nothing instead of doing good. It is the opposite of integrity. David Bowie's song about fame wasn't an ode to fame. It was a warning about the emptiness of it. Fame puts you there where things are hollow. Fame, what you get is no tomorrow. Fame, what you need, you have to borrow. The second concept is brand. It too has been transformed through technology. Branding is a simple enough idea. You produce something you're proud of and you put your name on it. Whether it's the symbol a rancher sears onto the cattle's hide or the stamp that Paul Revere put into a bowl. A brand was only as valuable as the quality of the products that they produced. And we depend on a tight fit between brand and quality. One of the world's most successful brands for many years was McDonald's, and their business was built on meeting a specific, universal need of every single American. Finding a clean toilet away from home. And with the advent of highways, business people, families, they were driving to places that they didn't know, and there were billboards promising the best food or the best bargain. But no one advertised, you know, come use our really clean bathrooms. Well, you know, it turned out people on the road didn't necessarily need the best food or the best bargain. They just wanted reliable food that wasn't too expensive and a clean bathroom. So McDonald's original advertising was mostly about how clean the place was. You know, it's, it's not quite David Bowie, but this is the original McDonald's song. Grab a bucket and mop. Scrub the bottom and top. There is nothing so clean as my burger machine. With a broom and a brush, clean it up for the rush. Before you open the door, put a shine on that floor. When we finish what then, start all over again. Tell me, what does it mean? At McDonald's, it's clean. They didn't even mention the burger, you know? It was about the pride that McDonald's workers 
took in keeping the place clean. They measured franchises on, on this metric, and they were selling an ethic of sacrifice and service to the traveler. We mop the toilet area all day long for you. A national brand was a great and rare thing to achieve then. In order to gain it, you needed to produce something that met a universal national need with the highest quality. Big data and technology have helped change this in some important ways. People now can have a customized experience. With our unlimited access to instant information, consumers can gather information online about precisely what they want uh, in short order. Any producers as well can gather information online about those consumers. And businesses study that data uh, to see what traits the customers possess so that they can grab people with similar traits before anyone else does. This all changes the equation of brand and quality. It's created an incentive to be fast and to put brand first. Rather than to produce the best thing to gain a brand, the goal is simply to get your information out ahead of everyone else's. Rather than keep customers based on one desired feature, you hook customers with speed and then keep customers based on other things that command loyalty to the brand itself. Brand loyalty. Because the goal is locking people into a brand, speed is always the key. And we can actually, you can actually feel the acceleration happening. It's like speed dating. Um, you know, we went from these 30 second ads on TV, then to posts, to tweets, then even shorter things, you know, vines and memes, and now it's just pictures. Uh, now in its time, the Gettysburg Address was considered an astonishingly short speech. It was three succinct paragraphs delivered in three minutes. That would never survive today. It's just way too long for Facebook or Twitter or most other social media. Instead, our political speech, likewise, is down to three words. Build a wall. Stop the boats. Axe the tax. Lock her up. Shorter, faster, better. And the result, again, challenges our integrity. We're not bound to a product by its quality. We're bound because companies scooped up our data, got to us first, and then trapped us in their brand loyalty programs. Brand loyalty in this context is, it's kind of a misnomer. It's more like, you know, like brand hostage. Uh, it's the Hotel California. You can check out any time you'd like, but you can never leave. If you've tried changing banks or changing mobile carriers, you know why most people remain with their original choice even if they don't like it very much. Airlines and hotels and others have perfected this with their bonus programs. In the US, for example, I only fly United. I've flown over one million miles on United Airlines. Even though the seats have gotten smaller, the legroom has shrunk, the miscellaneous charges have increased, they overbooked their flights, and they knocked out that poor doctor's tooth for not giving up his seat. <laughs> and other things that make the service, well, you know, less appealing than when I started. Uh, even after all that, I stay with them. Because with any other airline, you know, I, I'd be the one getting my tooth knocked out until I earned enough human dignity points through their brand loyalty program to get a better seat. <laughs> so their data analytics and speed are what drive my decision, not my satisfaction with the product. Elevating brand over quality not only degrades consumer experience, it also degrades the company's commitment to quality. Products go to market with serious bugs and cybersecurity gaps because speed takes precedence. The ethic is always, we'll patch it later. News goes out unconfirmed and with major mistakes, and the ethic is, well, it won't be wrong for long. You know, there's an old saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. It's not clear how far all this speed will take us. Ultimately, branding for branding's sake divides us. Reliable, clean bathrooms, those, those are a community asset. And building your reputation on that creates trust. A brand that isn't based on trusted products is just a way of actually separating you from others. Wells Fargo versus Bank of America. Rather than build a community, it just divides us into tribes. 
The third, debt versus accountability. Third set of pressures that are putting, uh, uh, pulling at our fabric of integrity. Mistaking debt for wealth. Wealth, wealth is a relative thing. But in each society, the experience of wealth is a feeling that you have what you need, plus just a little bit more. The benchmark for wealth in the United States was set in the 1950s. At that time, a single wage earner, working 40 hours a week, could afford a home, two-car garage, decent health care, pay for their kids' education, take vacations, um, retire with dignity, and leave a little bit behind for their children. That was and is the American dream. But our economy has changed since the 1950s. In the 1970s, wages stayed relatively flat. But thanks to women's equality, the effect was masked. With two wage earners at home, the American family could still afford the same house, cars, TV, health care, tuitions that their parents had. It just took twice as much labor to get there. And then as America's post-war advantages um, faded, other nations were catching up. Germany and Japan became hot economies, and world events unleashed new technologies and competition. Container ships and supply chains made it possible to make and sell things all over the world. The Berlin Wall fell and liberated half the world's economies to start competing. Labor markets opened up and a global competition began, and you could buy and build on any place on Earth. And yet again, those pressures were masked because operating worldwide also meant operating 24-7. So although wages were flat, people worked longer hours or multiple jobs, and they were still able to enjoy all the things that their parents and grandparents had enjoyed. Until we ran out of wage earners and hours in a day. And then we relied on easy credit. People could still have the house and cars and health care and tuitions and vacation, all the trappings of wealth, but they were borrowing to pay for it all. And when the global financial crisis hit, as Warren Buffett said, when the tide goes out, you see he's been swimming naked. American middle class families realized that they hadn't been living the American dream for a long time. They might have the house and the things their grandparents had, but they were working nights, days, and weekends, and they were borrowing money to pay for health care and tuitions. Instead of saving for their children, as their parents and grandparents had, they'd been borrowing from them. Today, the average American has virtually no savings. The median savings for a couple in their mid-50s today is $8,000. Seven out of 10 Americans have $1,000 or less in savings. Our economy changed and we didn't adjust our rules and norms to ensure that it still worked for everybody. Today, too much wealth is concentrated in too few hands. And it's harder to tax and to redistribute that wealth. Again, President Trump offers a useful illustration. While he won't release his tax records, he said in a debate that if he paid little or no taxes on his multi-billion dollar fortune, quote, that's because I'm smart, close quote. Bonds, bonds of trust can't survive when a few people have large sums of untaxable income and others have subsistence incomes and no savings. And the pressure on this system now is accelerating. In the near term, automation and AI threaten jobs that employ millions of the most economically vulnerable workers. And that sort of pressure is just not sustainable. America remains the wealthiest nation on earth and we are creating wealth at an exceptional rate. But we were too slow adjusting our social contracts to this new economy. And now, as a society, we have spread debt instead of wealth. And we violated the cardinal rule to invest in our future. Instead, we borrowed from it. And now the last depressing topic about integrity. Spin versus truth. Um, this is something most of us really didn't imagine, you know, could be shifted. The truth, you know, over a series of decades. Even immutable facts have become less certain, less trustworthy, less real. 
And again, technology is involved in this. It's not, and, and, and let me be clear, it's not technology's fault. Technology happens. It's the choices that we make in response that lead us astray. Now, we can't personally know the truth about everything, but reasonably, um, you know, we believe things are true because we hear them from trustworthy sources. You know, before the printing press was invented, written documents were trusted because, frankly, they were just so hard to produce. Only people with standing in the community and reputation had the resources to produce them. And so people got used to generally trusting things that were in writing. Printing presses disrupted this. They made it possible for all sorts of scandalous things to be published that wouldn't have been printed before. And, and while overall it clearly improved the free flow of information, um, for the short term it confused people. For many years, people questioned whether they could trust anything that they read. It may sound familiar. Today we have the printing press effect on steroids because we've had two media revolutions at once. The first one is about 30 years ago with the advent of cable news, we created a means of virtually limitless news. Instead of news organizations being forced to decide what events actually mattered, uh, they just needed to fill time with things that were newsy. Uh, and eventually they discovered that um, if they made news kind of a form of entertainment with teasers and arguments and frightening graphics, they could boost their ratings. And news programs took on a political slant. Before long, news balkanized so that every viewer could choose the news that reinforced their biases. Conservatives followed channels that informed uh, them that liberals were untrustworthy and capable of just the most irrational and diabolical acts. And uh, liberals followed channels that said the same thing about conservatives. Social media compounded this because its algorithms ensured that whatever political articles you clicked on, you would get more of those types of articles sent to you. Uh, they not only deepened divisions over opinions, it caused people to choose their own facts. And if this weren't enough, we then had the second wave of disruption. Um, with the arrival of cell phones and the World Wide Web, suddenly even news organizations couldn't control accuracy. Every person, every person in this room with a mobile device is a journalist and a publisher. Before the traditional media even hears about a story, people are uploading images and getting their own versions out faster than the news services. And to stay relevant, traditional media are running stories that they get from the internet, right, wrong, or horrifyingly wrong. Uh, and that has made facts more fungible. We had the spin room during the Clinton administration. The Bush era introduced us to the term truthiness and today, the Trump administration speaks of alternative facts and calls the New York Times fake news. Um, people too often just don't know what to believe. And so at one point, over 40% of Americans believe that their president, Barack Obama, was born in Kenya. Didn't matter that President Obama was born in Hawaii and that his birth had been duly recorded and reported in the newspaper for all to see. Bloggers created this lie, sent it around the, the world at the speed of the internet. News channels covered the phenomenon uh, as if it were actual news. And if anyone on earth recognized the power of this phenomenon, it was the chief evangelist of that claim, Donald J. Trump. Polls confirm new, deeper depths of gullibility. Today, some substantial portion of Americans actually believe that Michelle Obama is a man. No, just Google it. Yeah. Is Michelle Obama a man? You've got like 20 pages. Even more believe that climate change is a hoax, that airplane vapor trails are a government conspiracy to spread chemicals to humans, that vaccinations cause autism, and that the toilets here in Australia flush backwards. <laughs> so... In this environment, where facts are ignored and people choose the stories that support their own worldview, is it any wonder that a substantial number of voters believe even the most outlandish claims? That the President of the United States can claim that it wasn't raining on Inauguration Day when it was. That his crowds broke records when they didn't. 
that millions of people cast illegal votes when they did not. Our nation elected a president that was prepared to call into question not only a stunningly broad set of policies that had served the U.S. well, but has questioned basic facts and science. Um, so my friend Michael Rich put it, the United States today suffers from truth decay. And that brings me to the weaponizing of information. All the stretching and pulling of our integrity has been exploited by adversaries. There is now a deliberate effort to degrade our faith in information and to destabilize democracies. Today, Russia produces only three things at world-class levels, and none of them are vodka. It produces fossil fuels, weapons, and propaganda. They've got great expertise at all three, but their most ambitious export is propaganda. In 2005, Vladimir Putin launched Russia Today, which is a newspaper committed to disinformation. And it was more deceptive and better than the propaganda produced during the Soviet era. That, that effort's been expanded. You probably recall when the uh, Malaysia flight uh, crashed, the Russian ministry and RT manipulated satellite images to sow confusion about that event. During the Ukrainian crisis, Russia created fake social media accounts they produce false stories about the status of Ukraine and the conditions in Ukraine. But what was most important was the objective, which was different from classical propaganda. The stories weren't designed to actually convince people to believe Russia. Instead, Russia's goal was to make the information field so dirty that people wouldn't know what to believe. The goal was to make truth meaningless so that people would believe anything or believe nothing. And that brings us to now. There's now irrefutable proof that during the last election, Russia pushed out fake news stories through millions of accounts with the goal of changing the outcome of the 2016 presidential election and turning Americans against one another. I'll give you one example. One of those stories claimed that Hillary Clinton and her campaign manager, John Podesta, were funding her campaign with a child smuggling ring <laughs> and that they were actually holding children captive in the basement of a pizza parlor near DC to sell those children to pedophiles. That story was shared 310 million times. One person was so convinced it was true that he drove hours from North Carolina armed with assault weapons to rescue the children. And after shooting up the pizza parlor, he discovered that there were no children. There was no child smuggling ring. There wasn't even a basement. Putin could not have succeeded in spreading this kind of lie if we had not already stressed the fabric of truth to the point of tearing. 310 million shares of a story that a 70-year-old grandmother, U.S. presidential candidate, and most recognizable woman on earth was sneaking off the campaign trail to sell children to pedophiles out of a local pizza parlor? I mean, this only happens when some segment of the country no longer knows what to believe. Putin and other hostile nations and networks hope to capitalize on the turbulence of our integrity because they have proved without integrity we are all exposed. You know, Abe Lincoln said that you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And I think we all take great comfort in the last part of that. But how many people can you fool all of the time? Where there's no trust, where there's no confidence in facts, where there's no faith, it could become a majority. Which brings me to my last point. Optimism is one of the themes of this conference, and fortunately, <laughs> despite everything I said tonight, I am an optimist. I think the first step to recovering our integrity is just to acknowledge this challenge. Our democracy is a reflection of our choices and our neglect. 
and we have neglected to confront the challenges caused by the misuse of great technologies. We need leadership that refuses to sow fear and distrust and instead starts bringing people back together. Second, technology is not the problem. The technologies I've described do vastly more good than bad. In fact, there's nothing about today's technology that prevents us from continuing to be a society that admires achievement and quality over fame and brand, uh, that sacrifices for the future, and that demands the truth. It's simply a matter of bringing our rules and informal codes up to date. For too long, we've simply allowed technology to run away from a walkaway government. Third, I think we need to elect more people with an understanding of how technology actually works. You know, past leaders ignored hard questions about the effects of technology in part because they just, you know, it's confusing. The tech community has actually struggled with these issues far more than most policymakers. Many have thought hard about how we expose and eliminate lies and hate from the internet, how we encourage civility and accountability. They've asked the questions we all should have been asking. At what point does collecting people's data go too far and become an invasion of privacy? How do we enforce laws and norms online against people who try to hide their identities? How do we ensure that consumers even know what companies have collected from them and how they're using it? You know, should people own a share of the wealth that's being created by businesses that use their data? These aren't, these aren't tech questions. They're human questions. They're questions about integrity, how we relate to one another as a society. A hundred years ago, leaders asked similar questions when we transformed to an industrial society, and it led to labor unions and wage and hour laws and health and safety regulations and limitations on trusts and on monopolies. These rehumanized assembly lines and ensured that the new economy worked for everyone. The challenge for us here at Integrity 20 is to do the same thing, to put humanity first. We create technology for our benefit. It should serve our needs. And as a wise man said, to do this doesn't take a college degree. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and every one of us can be that servant. Thank you, and God bless you all.